I'll never forget the day when I completed my doctoral degree from New Orleans Seminary. Stood at the front of a chapel filled with graduating students and their families getting all kinds of degrees for all kinds of things to go all kinds of places and serve the Lord. Some were getting master's degrees, some were getting doctor degrees. I got to stand in line with eight other people who were receiving a doctor of ministries degree that day. And finally our time came and they stood me on a platform very much like this and they did something they called hooding you, which means they take this thing that goes around your neck and put it on you and then they hand you a diploma and they announce, now you are finished. And I got to walk away that day with my doctoral degree, something I had worked on for a long, long time. The thing I'll always remember about that day is my son Jamie was about two years old when I finished up. And he had come in and he sat out in the chapel and it got full and it got warm. And guess what he did? That's exactly right. He went sound asleep. Slept through the entire graduation ceremony till finally we were getting up and we were walking out and going out to the lawn where everybody was with their families and everybody's taking pictures and everybody's celebrating. And he woke up and he looked at me and he said, Daddy, who won? <laughs> and I said, I did, son. I did. Because it was the end of a long journey. From the time I started till the time I finished, a three-year program turned into a four-year program. Across the course of those four years, not only did I have a new child, I moved to a new church. Not only did I move to a new church, I took on a new role because I had been an education and youth minister, and now I was the pastor. So I spent those times learning how to be a pastor and learning a new town and learning how to be a daddy and working on this degree. And every night, everybody would go to bed about 8, 30, 9 o'clock. And I would go in the room until about 2 the next morning. I would work and work and work. Not only that, but the research project that I was building my whole program around had to be thrown away because it had to do with that place, and now I had to come up with something to do with this place. Over the years, there were dozens of trips to New Orleans, more nights than I can remember. I didn't get but a couple of hours sleep. Toward the end, there was a 250-page dissertation. And then the process of rewriting it and defending it in front of a faculty committee. (sighs) Over the years, there were a lot of times when I wondered, was it worth it? More than a couple of times when my patience hit its limit and times when the only reason I kept going was because Judith told me I couldn't stop. (laughs) But on that day it was finished. The work paid off. I had earned my degree. I had not done this because I wanted to be called doctor but because I really wanted to challenge myself to do the most I can. Now why am I telling you all of this? After all, I look out in this congregation and I see people who are so much more accomplished academically and professionally than I will ever be. I told you my story because I want you to understand something. During all of those years and all of that work and all of that sacrifice and all of that time, the thing that kept me going was knowing at the end of the road was that day that day when I would be finished that day when everything would be accomplished and for four years that day was always in my mind sometimes consciously sometimes in the back of my mind but it was always there Now, why is that important this morning? Because as followers of the Lord Jesus, that's how we are commanded to live. If Jesus is Lord, then we live our lives in terms of that day. Yes, we walk with him every day. Yes, we trust him for guidance and deliverance and strength and direction. But if Jesus is your Lord, then everything about your life should be lived in terms of that day, that day when you will see him face to face. 
The Bible tells us that if Jesus is Lord, he is Lord today, Lord tomorrow, and Lord for eternity. And this morning, I want to talk about that eternal day that Jesus calls us to live toward. So let's jump in. I want you to see what the Bible has to say about that day. And the first thing it says is this, the normal Christian life is lived in the light of eternity. That's the promise of the Bible. Just a few moments ago, we read from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is going to be a Sunday school focus that Rich is working on right now because it is such a rich and powerful book. It's a book where Paul deals with questions and problems facing the church. It's where Paul describes the presence and the exercise of spiritual gifts, talks about what it means to exercise spiritual marriage, how to go about worship, how to uh, practice the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians is a handbook about how to live the Christian life. But it is also a book about why to live the Christian life. And that's why the passage we read this morning tells us what we need to know. Let me read it to you, but give you a couple of special focuses. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short and no, uh, come short and no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship by his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what does the Bible tell you about living the normal Christian life? This is what it says. It says the Lord Jesus gifts you. It says the Lord Jesus calls you. It says the Lord Jesus equips you to live a consistent Christian life. He does everything that you need done in your life so that you can live and be fruitful for him. Why does he do these things? Well, there are several answers we could come up with. One answer would be, he does those things so you can follow him and walk with him every day. And that would be true. Another answer would be, so that you can use your life and your gifts to make a difference for him in the world. And that would be so. A third answer might be, so that you can discover and exercise the spiritual gifts that are uniquely yours through Jesus Christ, so that you can live a full life for him. And there's no doubt about that. Those are all great reasons, but Corinthians declares the primary reason. It says it is so that you will be ready for that day. God gifts you, God calls you, God empowers you, God uses you so that you will be ready when that day comes. The Christian life only makes sense when you know that everything is pointing toward that day. Why do you live the way you live? Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you practice what you practice? It's because I believe that day is coming. That day when I will see him face to face. That day when I will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. That day when everlasting life is open to everybody who belongs to Jesus. And I live my life in light of that day day unless you live toward that day you live your life without any real sense of ultimate direction you really have no idea what's lying before you if your whole concept of living a Christian life has to do with what's going on today this afternoon and maybe in the morning then you really don't know where you're headed as a believer It'd be like deciding to set out from a trip. Maybe you one day say, you know, I just need to make a trip. I need to go somewhere. I need to do something. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave Birmingham, and I'll go to Denver, Colorado. I've always wanted to see Denver. Those pictures I see on television, they are so beautiful. I think I will go to Denver. And so you set out. All you really know is I'm in Birmingham, and, and Denver's somewhere out west, and I'm sure if I head that way, I'll find it. 
So you head out that way, and every time you think you should turn right, you turn right, and every time you feel like you should turn left, you turn left. You roam around, you do what you think feels good without any real sense of what you're going. You're not following a map. You're just following your feelings and hoping that you'll end up where you set out to be. Now, here's my question. If that's how you go to Denver, what are the chances you're actually going to arrive at the place you set out to be? Almost nil. In the same way, the Christian faith has no ultimate purpose unless you know it is pointing toward a specific time and a specific place. It is pointing toward that day. That's what Paul declares powerfully later in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He says, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If it's only about today and only about tomorrow, how pitiful, how pitiful to think this is all that there is. Then he makes this powerful declaration about that day. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal put, must put on immortality. So then, when the corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gives us this strong word of direction. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In other words, this is what Paul is saying. The normal Christian life is lived daily with one eye on the day around us and one eye on that day. If you are living a Christian life the way God wants you to live it, that means you live fully engaged with the people around you, using your gifts, loving people, sharing Christ, doing what you can do. But you also know that day is coming. That day when our Lord brings us home. What do we need to know about that day? Well, let me tell you, share four things that are really important, and I'm going to start with the one that I really don't want to share, but it's there, so you have to hear it, okay? It will be a day of judgment. It will be a day of judgment. This is what the Bible says. It says everyone will arrive at that day, but nothing matters more than how you arrive. Hebrews 9, 27 says, For it is appointed unto men once to die, and then come judgment. What does judgment mean? Judgment does not mean necessarily condemnation. Judgment means that's the time when God takes each person into account and determines where their eternal destiny will be spent. Eternity hangs in the balance on that day. One of the most dangerous things that most of the people around you believe is this. In the end, when everything is settled, everybody goes to heaven. Well, everybody goes to heaven except the really, really bad people. It's almost as though popular opinion decides what is true and what is false about eternity. 
you kind of take a vote and everybody has their vote and everybody decides what happens next. The problem is that's not the way the Bible tells the story. To decide all that matters is what I believe will happen would be kind of like all of us deciding together to go to the top of this building and jump off because we've taken a vote and all of us have agreed that if I jump off, if we jump off this building and fall to the ground, not one of us is going to be hurt. And we jump off with full conviction because we believe it. Not only do we believe it, we all believe it. Everybody believes it together. And people can talk to you. They can talk to you about gravity. And people can talk to you about consequences. But it doesn't matter because we've already decided everybody's going to be okay. Except that's not the truth. What the Bible declares is on that day, some will be allowed into heaven and some will be uh, sentenced to spend eternity separated from God in that place called hell. The one that Paul just said is neutralized by the power of the gospel. Now, do I like telling you that? No. I wish it weren't the truth, but it is. I can't lie to you. That day will be a day of judgment. I'm glad that's not the end of things because it's just the beginning. The second thing you need to know is this. And your eternal destiny will not be determined by how you have lived when you come to that day. Another misconception people have is that if you think you've been good enough, you're allowed into heaven. A lot of people think what's going to happen when you stand before God on that day of judgment is he's going to take the good stuff you've done and the bad stuff you've done and if the good outweighs the bad then you're going to be okay. Here's the problem with that. God's not looking for good. He is looking for holy. And the only one who has ever been holy enough is the one who opens the door to that day. Romans 3.23 states it clearly, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Each one of us, all of us in our own particular and special ways have made those decisions when we turned away from God and his will for our lives. We still struggle with that today. There are times when we fall short. And when I fall short, I also fall short of God's holiness. So you can't just count on whether you've been good. You know, the truth is, the simple thing to do would be for all of us to look around the room. Just look at the people around the room. And you start thinking, okay, maybe I'm not perfect, but I'm better than you and you. And you, the truth is, I'm better than most people in this room, we tend to think, don't we? I look at folks, and I know things they've done wrong, and I know places they've fallen down, and I know, I know I'm a better person than they are. Problem is, is none of us come anywhere close to holiness. It's kind of like if we walked out in the parking lot, or maybe we got up after we fell down off the roof. And I handed out baseballs, and I said, okay, let's see who can throw a baseball to the moon. My ball might go higher than yours. Your ball might go higher than mine. But none of us are coming anywhere close to the target. That's what it means when the Bible says we've sinned and fallen short. The best you can do just isn't enough. You can't earn your way. Well, if not everybody's getting to go, and if you can't earn your way, then what do you need to know? You need to know that the only thing that will matter on that day is what you have done with the Lord Jesus. Listen to the promise of Romans 5. 8 and 9, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
What a powerful, powerful thing. God demonstrates his love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you. Not when you were at your best. Not when you were at your most spiritual. Not when you were at your most religious. Christ died for you while you were still a sinner. Why did he die for you while you were still a sinner? Because that's when you needed him the most. And that's when he loved you the most. And he looks down on this planet and he sees all these people and some are saved and some are lost. And he looks down and he says, I love all of them. And I want them to be saved. I want to be the one that saves them. The Lord Jesus, only the Lord Jesus, is our means of eternal life. That two-word phrase at the end of that passage means everything. Did you see how it ends? Through him. Through him who loved you and gave himself for you. And on that day, that day when you either look forward to it or you dread it, you recognize you're going to stand before God to account for who you are and what you've done. And instead of him saying, let me ask you about your life and let me ask you about the things you've done and the ways you've fallen short and the things you... All he's going to do is look at you and say, what have you done with my son, your Savior, Jesus Christ? While you were on earth, did you receive him as Savior? And if you say yes, eternal life. And if you say no, eternal separation from God Almighty. And on that day, we will see our Savior. The greatest thing about the Lord Jesus is that he loves you and he desires for you to spend eternity with him. And he loves you so much, he paid that ultimate price to purchase your salvation. Why can I come to heaven through him? What is it about him that's so special? What sets him so far apart? Well, listen to how Philippians describes his love. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Even death on a cross. I'm getting ready to transition to the next series in this year of If Jesus is Lord. We're going to talk about the fact that if Jesus is Lord, I live in the shadow of the cross. Because the cross changes everything. The cross changes everything. And on that day, the question is going to be, did you accept the one who gave himself on the cross so that you could have everlasting life? There's not time this morning to talk about all that means, but there'll be time in the weeks ahead. All you need to know this morning is this. Jesus did everything necessary for you to have abundant life today and everlasting life tomorrow. All you have to do is trust him and what he's done for you and receive him as your Savior and your Lord. That day is our ultimate hope. This is what the Bible says. It says Jesus is Lord. He is our Savior. Jesus is Lord. He is our guide. Jesus is Lord. And he is God's greatest promise to those who believe. And that is why that day will be the day when Jesus is revealed as Lord of all. How do I know Jesus is Lord of eternity? Because this is what the Bible says. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What's it going to be like on that day? 
Well, one thing I know for sure is this. We're going to come to that day on our knees. We're going to come to that day and our lips are going to confess. And we're going to come to that day, whether you're headed for heaven or headed for hell, you're going to have to confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. All of creation will acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord because Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord of you, Lord of me, Lord of life, and Lord of eternity. Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me ask you one more question this morning. So how are you supposed to live in light of that day? What kind of believer are you supposed to be when you know that's my destination, that's my direction, that's what I'm aiming toward, that's what I'm living for, that's what it's all about? Well, the answer is found in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, where Paul writes and says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. What is he saying? He's saying when you live in light of that day, you recognize every day God gives you an opportunity to make him known to show his glory, to share his salvation. What do I do when I recognize that day is before me? I recognize I don't want to waste another moment. I live for that day. I want to stand before the Lord and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant that was Paul's desire he said I'm already being poured out as a drink offering the time of my departure is at hand I have fought the good fight I have finished the race I have kept the faith finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day and not to me only but also to all who have loved his appearing This is what I love when I think about that day. I love the fact that we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus. He's going to watch how we've lived and he's going to reward the faith that we've exercised. And the Bible says you receive a crown of righteousness. I don't know exactly what that is. But I know this. The Bible says Paul and all who love his appearing, all of the folks who are so looking forward to that day, We will receive a crown. And then you know what you do. And then you bow. And then you confess. And then you lay your crown at the feet of Jesus. On that day. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord right here. He's Lord right now. He's Lord today. He's Lord tomorrow. He is Lord of eternity. So my question for you this morning is, are you ready for that day? Because none of us know when that day is going to come. It it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be 100 years from now. We don't know when that day is going to come, but we know that day is going to come. Before that day comes here, our time may come when we run out of our years here on earth and then we face that day with who we have been and what we have confessed. Which means this morning, there's nothing more important in the world than for you to know, I have made my peace with Jesus. I have trusted him as my Savior. I am ready for that day. And here's the greatest thing. And then you cross over because before you know him, that day has a sense of dread, a sense of finality, a sense of I'm not sure I want to come to that. But on this side, this side of the cross, that day becomes the time when you cry out, Maranatha, come, Lord, 
Jesus. Come. Are you ready for that day? If not, in just a minute, we're going to sing our, our invitation hymn. It will be your chance to come and give your life to Jesus, to settle that issue so that you'll never have to wonder again. It'll be that chance for you to begin to trust him to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And it'll be that opportunity to live for him the rest of your days. Looking forward to that day. Do you need to come? Do you need to come be a part of this church? Are you ready to join this fellowship and, and just say, Lord, Use me, work through me, help me to join these people as we worship together and look toward that day. Is there another decision you need to make? We're going to stand, we're going to sing our invitation hymn. This is your chance as the Holy Spirit speaks to you. You come. Let's stand.